Hey everybody, this is AHA Computing. In a nutshell, I'm your guide, Alex Nugent, and this episode is... What is a memristor? Uh, well, the name comes from memory resistor, a memory resistor. Uh, that, well, it's pretty descriptive, but if you don't know what resistance is, then that doesn't really mean anything. So I'm going to explain that concept and then uh, talk about uh, a few facts uh, about memristors and, and why, they're, why they're useful and, and uh, important. So first of all, let me uh, not talk about resistance, let me talk about conductance. It's, it's sort of easier to understand and manipulate. I think it's a more natural measure. It's just the inverse measure of resistance. Okay, so what is conductance? Imagine that you have a water tower like this, and it has a whole bunch of water up in a tank, and we wanted to empty that tank. And so we have a pipe, and we opened up the, the nozzle at the bottom of the pipe, and we just let the water drain out. Okay, so imagine we measured the time it took in order to um, drain this tank, and it took three hours. Okay, now what if we increased the diameter of the pipe? Okay, so in this case, uh, more water can pass through the pipe, and what we've done is increased its conductance. And what we'll find is that if we let all the water drain out again, same amount of water, uh, it'll take less time. Okay, so more current can flow. This relationship is summed up by something called Ohm's Law. Here I've written it uh, with conductance rather than resistance, which is sort of the standard way to write it. And it really just relates these three variables. Now in electronics, Pressure, um, the amount of sort of force being exerted in this tank due to gravity, would is an analog to voltage. Uh, conductance is an analog to sort of the diameter of the pipe, um, how much water can flow through it. And current is really just the amount of uh, water that's flowing. Okay, so in electronics, it's uh, the conductance is a measure, inverse measure of resistance. It's how much current can flow. Uh, pressure is voltage, and current is you know, the amount of electrons um, that can flow per second. Okay, so here's, here's the analog. Um, pressure is a voltage source. It could be a battery. This little symbol right here is a symbol for a resistor or a conductor. And ground is uh, it's a sink. It's where all the electrons go to spread out. It's you know the negative terminal of a battery. Um, it's just uh, the path from source to sink, and electronics is just about getting in the way of that flow, just like, just like this water pipe. So the question becomes, what happens if the conductance of our conductor changes as we use it? And that's, uh, in essence, all a memristor is. Uh, it's, it's this resistor that changes resistance, or alternately a conductor that changes its conductance as you apply voltages to it, as, as you use it. And this is the symbol that we like to use here at GNOME. Uh, this is, this is the, the standard definition, uh, def standard symbol of a memristor. Um, check out the episode about the, the polarity conventions. So basically, uh, that's it. It's, it's a resistor that changes resistance or conductor that changes conductance as you use it. So in the case of this, this water pipe here, uh, as we allowed water to flow, flow through it, uh, it would uh, increase its conductance. This property is summed up nicely in this plot called a, a hysteresis loop. Uh, and the theoretical inventor of the memristor, Dr. Leon Chua, has said famously that if it's, uh, if it's pinched, it's a memristor. Uh, what he means by that is that if you take a memristor and you apply a sinusoidally varying voltage across it and you measure the current and you plot the current as a function of voltage, uh, what you'll get is this pinched hysteresis loop. So let me just take you through uh, one cycle of it. Let's look at the blue uh, trace here. These are all for different frequencies. Uh, so as we, as we increase the voltage, uh, the current increases linearly as a function of the voltage, and it has a shallow slope, which means its conductance is low. And then it hits this threshold of adaptation, and the conductance starts to increase. And so what that does is it increases the slope. Okay, so you go from this resistance, which is you know this shallow slope, to this resistance, which is a steeper slope. Okay, um, so more conductive. 
uh, the, the voltage turns around, it's oscillating, remember, and, and swoops back down. Now it's in this uh, higher conductance state. And uh, the polarity reverses. So now, you know, the, the magnitude of the voltage is, is flipped. And uh, we get to a reverse adaptation threshold. This causes the conductance to um, decrease. So again, we move from this, this, uh, this high conductance state to a low conductance state, a shallow slope. And then the cycle continues. Okay, so what uh, Dr. Chua uh, means by this is uh, a pinched hysteresis loop. It goes through the origin. Okay, this means that it's not storing energy. So if we uh, try to do this for, say, a capacitor or an inductor, uh, we'd end up sweeping out circles. Um, the fact that it goes through the origin uh, sort of implies that there isn't uh, energy stored um, in this device. It's, it's storing something, information, about how it was used, um, but it's not uh, an energy storage device. So just some simple uh, Minmerster facts. Um, people um, have been misinformed, I think, by some of the uh, sort of popular um, sort of media stories about it. Um, so there's some misconceptions. So Memristors describe a very broad class of resistance changing devices and they have been around since before uh, HP announced their discovery in 2008. Um, there's been a number of groups before that that had them. They just didn't call them Memristors. They called them variations of things. Resistance changing devices, RERAM. Um, there's a lot of devices out there that change the resistance as you use them, and they're all memristors. Um, they're achievable through a variety of physical mechanisms. Um, there's phase change, electrostatic, redox. These, these are all different ways of making devices that change the resistance as you use them. Uh, chemically mediated, electromechanical, sort of the alignment of, of, uh, of uh, particles in a liquid. That's how I uh, first envisioned it. Um, you know, substances that change... Uh, change their phase from ordered uh, sort of crystalline to amorphous and in so doing change the resistance. There's lots of ways to go about it and I think there'll be more ways discovered in the future. And there's a lot of applications that are enabled by memristors uh, with orthogonal properties. And when I mean orthogonal, I mean it's very hard or perhaps impossible to achieve uh, certain properties at the same time and certain uses um, are radically different than others. And memristors apply just like just like resistors and transistors and capacitors can be um, applied to many different circuits, so can memristors. So let me give you some examples of this. So there's some uh, oscillation, oscillators, uh, that you can make with memristors. Um, now, for this circuit to be practical, uh, the memristor has to have very high endurance. You have to be able to switch it a lot of times. Uh, and that, um, that can give you problems with some types of memristors, especially if they're optimized for non-volatility. Uh, they'll break after so many cycles. Um, so what, what you want in the case of an oscillator is really high endurance. Um, and you might not want that um, non-volatile property, or low decay is probably the more accurate way to say that. Um, learners, this is what uh, uh, Gnome Inc. Is, is really interested in, the ability of making learning circuits. Uh, for this, we want incremental behavior. We want to be able to step the conductance up or down uh, by applying pulses uh, to mimic learning. Uh, in this case, we want that incremental property, but in, in most of the cases, we want very low decay. We want to be able to hold those memories for a long time. Um, for memory applications, just say digital memory. In this case, we want really fast switching. Uh, this is uh, sort of at odds with, with uh, slower incremental um, learning properties. Uh, you also want low decay. You want to be able to hold or retain the memory for a long period of time. Uh, and so in order to get that low decay, you have to have um, big uh, potential energy barriers between the states and you have to apply a little more voltage in order to make things switch but that uh, causes more energy to be dissipated that can lead to devices um, blowing out sooner so you get less cycles but you get these other these other properties and then finally optimizers um, in this case uh, sort of combinatorial optimization think of it as the ability to um, sort of keep a running tally of, of a probability um, so we can build circuits that do this, um, but in this case, we again need very high endurance because we're constantly um, incrementing these things. But 
we don't necessarily need the, the load decay property uh, because we only have to retain those, uh, those uh, summations or those in increments for um, small windows of time and then the problem changes or the constraint changes. Okay, so all of these applications require different uh, properties and you can achieve them with different types of memristors, different material stacks, different um, physical configurations and chemistry and whatnot. Uh, memristor does not imply non-volatile. Um, that's just one application of it and it was made very famous by HP's marketing department, but it is not the only application. It's actually one of, of a much larger set of applications. And many, many memristors out there um, are not uh, non-volatile. They, they will decay over a period of time, ranging from milliseconds to weeks or months. Uh, in short, you can think of memristors as sort of these little resistive state machines. Um, they, they have a history. Uh, that's the whole point. They, they have this memory associated with them. Um, they also sort of have a lifespan. They're born when they're created. Uh, many of them have to be formed um, before they have their properties. It means you have, to, you have to do something to them. You have to apply voltages in a certain way in order to create, say, the filamentary structure. Some of them you don't need to do that. Um, then as you use them, uh, they'll burn out after after some period of time and they'll stop working. Um, some of them will take longer than others, um, but they remember um, sort of their prior history, They're these little state machines. Um, and finally, uh, it's not just resistance. Some of them change their capacitance as well. Um, and some of them, as they change their resistance, also change their capacitance. So it's complicated. Like you know, anything in the real world is. Whenever you go down and really investigate what's out there, um, the fact is there's a lot of stuff that's out there. And the whole challenge and the opportunity is to find memristors with the properties that match your application and really exploit that physics to your benefit. Okay, so that's what we're doing at GNOME with um, learners, with incremental learning. Um, that's why we developed the um, BSAFW memristor. Now, and this is the exciting part, is you can now buy and develop with memristors. Uh, we're opening up our technology to anybody who wants to use it. Uh, so this is possible because this amazing woman, Dr. Chris Campbell, and uh, her students at Boise State University, uh, she has been working on resistive changing devices for a decade now. And... Uh, you know, I went to her, um, seeing if she could formulate a memristor that had the, the properties that I wanted. And she, she really did. She, she gave me just about exactly what it is that I asked for. Um, so this is me with a, you know, a silly looking grin on my face because I'm excited. Finally, after a decade of dreaming about this, um, we got them. We were at a point where memristors can be made. They can, their properties can be tailored. Um, it's really exciting. So at GNOME, we're here to help you uh, develop this new memristive technology stack. In our case, we call it neuro-memristive because we're after incremental learners, but like I showed you, there's all these other applications for it. And uh, we're offering a variety of uh, services and products. So you can buy discrete chips from us. Uh, if you have a circuit that you'd like put on CMOS, we can help you with that. If you'd like custom wafers, uh, custom electrode uh, layouts, whatnot. Uh, we also offer raw data for all of our memristor devices. So you can um, import that, model it, uh, build your circuits, and uh, simulate them. Uh, we'll help you. This is an exciting time. And, well, memristors have arrived.